This is episode number 20 of the Expert Table Tennis Podcast with me, Ben Larkham. And my guest on today's show is Larry Hodges. Now, Larry is probably most well known for his daily blog that he puts out Monday to Friday over on his website, tabletenniscoaching.com. That's a great place just to find all sorts of table tennis news and coaching articles and videos. So I'm sure that if you're a follower of online table tennis, you will have seen that. He's also got loads of books. He's a full-time coach. Larry pretty much does it all. And I've wanted to have him on the show for ages. I'm really glad that we've managed to find the time to get him on the show and to interview him. And in today's show, we'll be talking a lot more about the tactical side of the sport, which is something that Larry knows a lot about. He's particularly interested in the tactical and analytical side of the game. And he's also written a book on the subject called Table Tennis Tactics for Thinkers, which is you know, his best-selling book out of the many that he's written. It's quite a long interview, about 50 minutes in total. Normally I try and cut bits out, but it was just too good to cut down. So we've got 50 minutes with Larry Hodges. Let's get straight into it. I'm sure you are going to enjoy it. Joining me on the show today is Larry Hodges. Hi, Larry. Hi, how are you doing? Yeah, doing very well. How are you? I'm oh, pretty good. I just got back from coaching and we're all set to go. Now, I was trying to come up with a, a kind of snappy way to introduce you, but you just do way too many things for me to come up with something. Can you um, explain all of the different table tennis related things that you do? Because you seem to be kind of the, the busiest man in table tennis at the moment. Yeah, this that could take a while. Uh, I mean, huh. I want to say, okay, I coach pretty much full time, both private coaching and group sessions. I'm a pretty much a full time writer because I do my daily blog and nine books seven on table tennis and lots of short articles, tips of the week. I'm also on the board of directors for USA table tennis, which takes up a lot of time. And uh, I've also recently been uh, appointed. I'm now chair of the USATT league committee and I'm also the regional associations coordinator. So I'm working on setting up regional associations and I'm working on setting up leagues, especially team leagues. Although we're also going to be looking into singles leagues that might be rated. That's something will be coming out later. So I work a lot of stuff for that. At the Maryland Table Tennis Center, where I coach, um, I'm a sponsored coach from Butterfly, and I do a lot of publicity work for them and a lot of miscellaneous things. Like we had, uh, we we get a lot of press coverage and stuff like that. So I'm involved in a lot of things like that. I'm even involved in non-table tennis because I'm I'm tutoring some of our kids as well at the club. It's table tennis because we're at the club and they're table tennis players. So I tutor in English, I tutor math also, though not not, not as much recently. So I'm involved in quite a lot of things i've also of course got a lot of besides the writing table tennis i uh, write science fiction fantasy and sometimes i mix them together because i have a, a fantasy table tennis novel i think we'll talk about that later yeah yeah i read that one that, that was actually really good so i mean how do you manage to fit all of this stuff in it seems like you there's pretty much nothing in table tennis that you don't do it's not easy it's i don't actually wake up in the morning just jumping up and down ready to go uh, it takes me about a while to get started, but once I get started, I can just keep try to keep at it. Um, one thing that actually makes it even more difficult is we have an after-school program. So every morning I get my blog done by about 10 a.m., and I have to leave at around by 2.30 to pick up kids to take to our club, and then I do table tennis and some tutoring and stuff, and then private coaching and group sessions. So I actually try to get all my USATT and other non-coaching stuff, writing everything between them, now, between 10, 10 a.m., and 2.30, plus occasionally I'll have lunch or something, and then run off, pick up the kids, do the coaching, do the group sessions, and then that night I come back, and then I spend a few minutes debating whether to jump back into it or watch TV or read. <laughs> yeah, so you try and get work and bits and bobs done in the morning, and then afternoons are always pretty pretty full on with table tennis, are they? Right. And then in the, sometimes I'll, end up, I'll get started on something, and I'll work late at night, and sometimes that makes it – Sometimes on my blog, I put these notes about how blog will be up by noon. What that usually means is I was up till three in the morning working on something or writing something. Right. Yeah. So sleep just has to take yeah. a back seat sometimes. Yep. Yeah. And um, the club that you're involved with is Maryland Table Tennis Club, isn't right. it? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Okay. It's the Maryland Table Tennis Center in Gaithersburg, Maryland. We opened back in 1992. There were no full-time table tennis centers in the U.S. devoted to training. There were a few that came and went that had you know, leagues and stuff, and there had been a few attempts, but no one had ever done it successfully. Now, Chen Yinghua and Jack Huang, two from, you know, members of the Chinese national team, former members, uh, they were in Maryland, 
and they were debating whether to go back to China. And then we had some discussions and we said, let's, let's try opening up a full-time table test center. And everyone told us that's crazy. There aren't enough players in the United States to support a full-time t- table test center. They just, it just won't work. And uh, so we decided to do it anyway. And of course that was 92. We're still in operation and we're in our, I think our 24th year. And it actually has been profitable from the first year. And uh, we now have, it's 10,000 square feet, 16, to 18 tables, uh, I believe it's six or seven full-time coaches, depending how you define that, about five part-time coaches, you know, leagues. Uh, they you know, sell equipment. They have a pro shop, uh, pretty much everything. have lots and lots of group sessions and private coaching. Of course, a big junior program that a number of years we used to dominate the country. We're still one of the strongest in the country. So it's uh, been a pretty successful one. And uh, Chen, Jack, and all, all three of us have been there since the very beginning. Yeah, that like that sounds pretty incredible, and I mean now there seems to be full time clubs popping up all over the place yeah, in the U.S. Isn't there? It was people forget that when we opened in '92, we were the only one, and we were the only one for the first ten years, and then they got a few more, and then as of about seven, uh, eight years ago, I think as of early 2006, I actually take that back, 2007, in December 2006, I gave a report to the board of directors. At that time, there were only eight or nine full-time training centers in the United States. And I tried to get USA Table Tennis involved in the recruiting and training of people to set up these things. And I was kind of laughed at by a couple saying that once again, there just aren't enough players. And if there were, it's only going to happen in a couple of places in the country. And uh, that was just 2007. And here we are 2015 and now we're over 80 full-time centers. So we went from at most around 10 to around 80 in the years. And those people, just didn't believe it could happen. There are a lot of things like that where people say it can't happen, and that's just the bureaucracy you always face. Yeah, and it seems like you're very much someone that if you've got a vision, you just go for it and and see it through and find a way to make it happen. Yeah, there there are a bunch of ones like that. Uh, even the tactics book, some people didn't think there'd be a market for something so simple as that, and the reasoning was that no one else had done it. Therefore, it probably wouldn't be a market. I thought that was an interesting one. Yeah, I'd like to go all the way back and and talk about how you first got involved in table tennis okay. and 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 yeah just why you fell in love with the sport because it's clear that you really really love table tennis so yeah how did that okay. all happen it was a very very weird thing I, I played some ping pong with neighborhood kids when i was a kid but i didn't actually start until i was 16 i was a very late starter and i got started in a very humorous weird fashion i was on my middle or tri- high school track team and i was a miler i ran 453 it was my best mile uh anyway i went to the library to get a book on track and field i'm emphasizing the t in track and i just happened to look to my left and to the left of track and field is table tennis and there it was the money player by our mighty reesman so i checked it out on the spur of the moment with some other books on miling and stuff and I uh, went home and read about, discovered USA Table Tennis. And I, I haven't been playing a couple times at, at neighbors' houses. And so I got interested and discovered that there was a club a few miles away, the New Carrollton Table Tennis Club. So my parents took me there. And before I went there, I talked to a Mrs. Cronledge, who was the president of the club. And she warned me not to exp- have high hopes. And I, I thought she was probably right. I, there'd probably be someone at that club who could beat me. <laughs> anyway, so I went there with – Wait, you know, waiting to see if there'd be any competition and uh, they have a ladder there. So I got in there and I, anyway, I played all night long and uh, there were 43 players on the ladder. There was a nine year old girl who I was able to beat. And there was a 12 year old boy who had just started. I could beat. I was 41st and it took me months to break into the top 40. <laughs> so I was pretty much at the very bottom. I was at that time, probably an 800 player or 700 player. And I was playing with a ping pong grip with my thumb down the middle on the same side on for forehands and backhands, but they cured me of that habit pretty quickly. The funny thing is 10 years later, I met Marty Reisman. By this time now, I'm a you know, top player because you know, I've been training a million hours per day continuously, it seems like, and I told him the story. And Marty Reisman, for those who don't know him, you know, he's the most flamboyant player in U.S. history probably, you know, U.S. champion everything, could have won a lot of titles except Sponge. He was a hard bat player, and Sponge ended, his, uh, ended it for him. But anyway, so I told him the story. And his exact words were about how he had gotten me into table tennis were great. Another life I've ruined. (laughs) 
So that was a lot of fun. Um, after I spent a number of years training, I actually was hired at the Olympic Training Center to be the uh, first assistant manager for table tests. Uh, they secretly also wanted me to do some writing. They, they had me do a lot of writing because they needed some coaching materials. And I've been playing for a number of years and already writing articles. And uh, so I became assistant coach, practice partner, and then the manager. And while I was there, I actually started writing science fiction fantasy in my free time. So I also got in my hobbies there. But uh, I, I started writing a lot of table tennis articles for them. Later became the director and one of the coaches for the program. So that's how I got started. Now I'm 55 years old, getting older and slower, and wishing I could go back to when I was 16 and say, Larry, develop your backhand attack. You're not always going to be able to run around and attack with your forehand. I have a steady backhand, but I'm mostly a forehand attacker. At what point did you – did you kind of peak as a player? Because obviously 16 is very late to yep. start. Um, I probably, the ratings have inflated, so it's hard to judge that. But I was probably, I had a, I was playing really well in the middle 80s, and I had some arm problems and dropped back down. Um, then in the late 80s, I came, I had more arm problems, and I was a practice partner. Then around 1990, I had a, I came back and started playing really well. So I had a, a couple of years in the middle 80s, and then the 1990, 92, at some, my best, it was I reached 18th in the country. Um, I was the national college doubles champion, uh, na- two-time national college team champion. I made the quarters of singles where I got stuck with Quan Nguyen, who was the top seed who would win it every year for a number of years. And I noted that at the time I lost to him in the quarters, the top um, the players in the semis, I played all three of them in, within the last two months and beaten all three of them. But I got stuck with Qua, unfortunately, who was t- – he was on the national team, Olympian, everything. Anyway, future Olympian. So singles, I did that. I did later on pick up hard bat and become a two-time national hard bat champion. I think four-time doubles champion hard bat. But I'm more normally a sponge player. You know, loop and hit on the forehand. Mostly loop these days, although I used when I loop and hit and countering on the back end, steady back end. Um, I guess the I did win a bunch of a bunch of small regional tournaments, but I probably college doubles and teams is probably the best titles yeah and i mean getting into the top 20 in the u.s is is pretty impressive in itself isn't it yeah that was the highest one in numerical rating my highest rating for u.s players was 2292 but the ratings have inflated since then i probably set okay. the record for most ratings over 2250 over a many year period i once calculated i had at least 70 different ratings over 2250 without ever breaking 2300 i had one <laughs> tournament three-day tournament at the teams where if I'd stopped after the first two days, I'd have been possibly top 10 in the country, 2,500, but I went 0-6 on the last day and blew everything and ended up at 20, uh, 2270 something because I lost right. three fifty pointers on the last day. I was exhausted. I was angry at some st- I was irritated because my partners didn't sh- show up late and it was all done. I couldn't play that day. So after two days of destroying all these 2,400 players, I lost to a three 2100 players and three 2200 players on the last day 0 6 <laughs> so what kind of age were you then that was i think that was in my late 20s I forget the exact year okay because i'm i mean I, I get a bit obsessed with age and and people starting late and things like that and because so many of my listeners started as older teenagers or adults and and generally it's it's kind of assumed that you need to start young to reach the highest levels you have to um Starting at 16, it's not likely I'm going to challenge the Chinese team members, but I trained really hard and I focused on learning it properly. That's a key thing. I learned it properly, but at the same time, I think one reason I think I was able to get good quickly because I reached a 2000 level in about under two years and 2103 or so, about four years, was that I didn't just listen to the coaches. I analyzed everything they said and figured a lot of things out for myself. But I you have to spend a lot of time thinking about a lot of time training. And you have to learn it properly. The time to learn, you, you can experiment, especially with serves, but learn it properly at the start. Don't do, don't start out with weird shots and stuff. If you have something that's weird, that kind of works, you can use it as a pet shot. But in general, learn it properly. Get a good grip, good strokes. Get a good coach. Watch the top players. And if you do that, after a few years, it will really, really pay off. No matter what age yeah. you start. I've got, I've got, I've got a guy named Julian Watchers. Uh, he'll be glad that he, he's on this thing. He started playing seriously, I believe, in his 30s. I forget the exact year. I, I, if I'd known I'd bring him up, I'd get it. But he was in his 30s, and he joined one of my classes as a beginner, and he was like a 1,000 player. And so 10 years later, 
He's over 2,000. He spent then the next 10 years at the 2011 or close to it. He's now, I think he's older than me, and he's late 50s, and he's still about 1950. But he didn't start till he was, I, I think he was 35 when he started. Yeah, so you can do it as an adult. It's just, obviously, it's difficult to actually reach the highest level, but there's nothing stopping you from reaching right. a really strong level. Right. The reason jo- uh, Julian and people like that who can start late and keep doing it is they learn it properly. He has very nice technique. And so he, he developed the game that he learned the game properly. And because he learned it properly at the start, he has sound foundation. Now there's other ones who learn the, uh, something weird. There's another way. Some people learn weird styles and use the weirdness to make up for poor technique. And sometimes you can get away with that, but I don't recommend it. Mm. It's just not an easy way of doing it. Uh, long tips is another way of doing it. Sometimes you can learn it. It simplifies the game you know, down to mostly keeping it in play. There's more to it than that. It's it slows the game down, so when you play a faster player, you can get away with that. But like Julian played inverted on both sides. Well, I mean, it sounds like you've always had the kind of mentality of a coach being quite analytical and really learning about the game, not just doing what the coach tells you and then going home. Did you always feel like you were destined to become a coach, or did you kind of stumble into that out of just chance? Okay, well, I, I started playing when I was 16, and I started coaching when I was 16. Oh, uh, really? What I did is because the local club uh, was only open three times a week, Tuesdays, Fridays, Sundays. I still remember the, the days and times. Um, I need other things to play. So I found um, a local community center, and I started teaching some other players to play. Uh, Mike Shapiro. There's one kid named Brian Masters who was a uh, top junior. He started coming over after I'd played a year or so. He started practicing with me, but I started teaching some other people. And there I found some others because I was going there. And that once I started getting decent, others would join me there. You know, Jerry Goldman, Timothy Ang, and others. And uh, so we, start, we had this group that went to this local recreation center. And we'd practice there every day, day after day after day. And I'd always be the first there and last to leave. And so we had a lot of fun there. And we practiced there. And then we'd all then go to the club. And uh, so we, I was coaching some of these players right from the beginning. And by the time I was 19, I was actually coaching some – I wouldn't say regularly, but semi-regularly. And uh, I start, I became a regular coach by when I was 21. And I've been coaching pretty much since I was 25. I've been into coaching almost, I won't say full-time, pretty regularly. You spent a lot of time coaching table tennis. Yeah. And I started writing articles right from the beginning. I think my first my first published article on table tennis was when I was 16. But that was a letter to the magazine about uh, sponsoring some players. My first coaching article, I believe – was when I was 19, 1979, I started writing some coaching articles. And I went on from there. What was it about table tennis that you really loved so much that got you completely hooked on it? I think it was the tactical analytical side. Right from the beginning, I always liked uh, the idea of finding out these we- uh, ways to win. And you know, you, you develop a foundation because if you don't, it's like chess. If you're playing chess and you have all the pieces, it's a very it's a very tactical game. But if you start without your queen or without a rook, you're at a big disadvantage. And that's the same as not having a foundation. So you develop the foundation, your tools. And once you have those tools, find you the best way to use them. So I, I would, right from the beginning, I was constantly analyzing what you had to do to become a top player. And, and uh, it mostly paid off. It, you know, I got pretty good. Not Obviously, I can't beat the, U, the top U.S. players, but I beat a lot of people who beat the best U.S. players. And I, mm. I, I did knock off a lot of, Top players, members of the Canadian national team, Israeli national team, um, a bunch of other ones like that. Yeah, you know, it's like I've had some good wins, a lot of twenty, a lot of twenty four fifty, twenty five hundred players in USATT ratings. That's back then that equates to call top in the ten to twenty range in the country. These days the ratings have gone up a little bit, but those are my best wins in general. But it, it comes down to analyzing these things and finding ways to win with the tools you've developed. Yeah, do you, th- do you feel like that's always been a strength of your game is the tactical, analytical side of it? Uh, yeah. yeah. I, in fact, my funnest part of writing my tactics book was bringing up some of the more interesting ones that have taken place in the past. I had to restrain myself because I could have written a whole book over just that aspect. <laughs> you just remember all the different things that you've done and different stories. Yeah, tactical stuff. things. There, there's some really interesting tactics. For example, I was coaching Nathan Shu in a match a, a few years ago, and uh, – he was playing this top Canadian junior. They're into the fifth game. And between games, I've been telling Nathan is he had to attack this guy's serve because the guy, uh, you know, you had to be aggressive off this guy's serve. And 
after the fourth game, I noticed something. The other guy, he served the ball and immediately stepped off the table. And Nathan flipped it, and the guy looped it. It's happened a couple times in a row. So anyway, then suddenly, at I think it was 3-3 three, three or something like that in the fifth game, we'd only watch the uh, – no, I think it was – anyway, the other guy had served uh, two times, and he's about to serve a second time, and I call timeout. Who heard, who's ever heard of calling a timeout at 3-3 three, three or so in the fifth game? And I called him over and said, no matter what this guy does, he's going to serve short again like he's been doing. No matter what you do, drop it short. Uh, if it's a toss spin serve, just chop block it, but just drop it short. And sure enough, the guy serves it. Nathan drops it short but pops it up. And the guy is so far off the table, he practically falls out of his shoes trying to step in for the ball, and he messes it up. Nathan drops the next one short. It happens again. And from the rest of that game, he keeps dropping it short, and the guy finally starts staying close. And then Nathan starts flipping. And anyway, when it was all done, he scored uh, – he – from, I forget the exact score when I called the timeout, but he wins the game 11 to 4. And after it's done, Nathan's mom came running over and said, What did you say? What did you tell him? And so I explained what happened. And you know, that was just an example that, off the top of my head of watching what's going on. It was just a little tactical thing. So there's always a lot of fun stories like that, where something like that. And of course, the nightmare is I tell him to drop it short, and the guy comes out there and serves fast, out, uh, serves fast and deep. That would be the scary part. But hopefully, yeah. Nathan's reactions will have taken care of that part. So I guess that's the reason why you wrote the book, is it? That, you know, tactics can be the difference between winning and losing a game. And yet, at the same time, they're often neglected or not given the importance compared to other aspects of the game. Is that is that kind of what you think? Uh, definitely, yeah. I, I watch matches and sometimes I'm just, I can't, sometimes it's difficult to watch because I'll see someone who I want to win, I can't say anything. Uh, I was watching a player who I wanted to win at the team trials uh, this, this year. And I was, I had to look, finally look away. I almost got on the phone because there was a player who's notoriously weak against a certain serve. Uh, if you serve short to the fore and long to the back end, and all they're doing is serving the middle and the back end. And the player is also weak in the middle and they kept attacking the forehand. And it was, it was frustrating to watch. And uh, I've had a couple of ones like that. If you just change the tactics, they win for sure. Uh, the one I just mentioned, I coached that player against that player, and they'd won each time, and it just didn't, for some reason, it forgot new tactics. So they, they have to watch these things sometimes. Would you say that tactics are more important uh, at the really high level, kind of an international play, or are they more important at the at the beginner level where people have got big big weaknesses and holes in their game, or, or do you think it's just applicable for, for all levels? Okay, it's... It applies to all levels, but at the beginning level, you got to get the fundamentals down. But at the same time, if you don't develop the habit of th tactical thinking, uh, it's just like table tennis. If you have a bad habit, it's hard to break it. If you play table tennis for a couple of years, develop good fundamentals physically, but don't think tactically, it's very hard to uh, suddenly get that into your game. You need to be thinking about the game right from the beginning just to make a habit of understanding what's going on. If you do that right from the beginning – it becomes second nature and you become a much better tactical player because tactics is a habit. Uh, players. I know a player once came to me. He, I was coaching another player and he came over, asked if I could coach him, but I couldn't. So I came over, discovered he was down two zero to a much weaker player. And so he called a timeout. He came over. Uh, I'd actually got to watch part of the second game and he was all frustrated because every time he served short, the guy was, uh, Back, short backspin, the guy dropped it short. When he served it long, the guy looped it. He didn't know what to do. And I said, have you served short? No spin to the middle. And he sort of looked at me. It's like, and he said, oh, my God. He went back out there, served short to the no spin to the middle over and over. And sure enough, the, it's harder to drop that ball short. And the guy popped it up, couldn't do anything with it. And, my, you know, the guy came back and wins really easily. And afterwards, he came back, and he was really embarrassed. He said that it's like I can think away from the table. But it just isn't a habit at the table. And that's the problem. A lot of people analyze away from the table, but they're not in the habit of doing it at the table. It's kind of obvious if he's dropping your short backspin serve short, then switch to a short no spin, which tends to pop up, and then he mix it back and forth. And he knew that. If he actually thought about this on the sidelines, it would have been easy for him. But he wasn't in the habit of thinking about it. And so the obvious became something that he hadn't thought of. So he he won the match on that. And afterwards, he, was, he wants me to coach other matches, but the idea is you got these ones like this are 
the easy ones. You got to learn to think like that, but it becomes a habit if you do it regularly. Yeah, I mean, I read through your book when it was when it first came out a couple yep. of years ago now, and that was something that really struck me was kind of I think I I realized that I'd kind of been in this non-thinkers category that you mentioned, even though I'm, you know, I'll, I'll write about tactics on the blog or I'm, I'm happy to be in the corner coaching someone else and thinking about tactics. When I'm actually on the table playing the game, I think a lot of the time I'm not actually thinking about tactics myself because it's just... I think you're right. When I was younger, it wasn't really a habit that I got into. And now I just kind of go out and play on autopilot. Yeah. And that was something that, you know, I don't play that much anymore. But when I do, I, I'm that's something that I'm really trying to work on because that would have such a big effect on my actual yeah. performance against other players. Yeah, well, it's a lot of people understand that the tactics also make you a better, a better player in the long run. I, if you're playing smart tactics, you develop, it sets you up for shots against strong players. If all you can do is serve long, for example, and the guy keeps looping it, you're forced to block. You learn to serve very shorter serves. You get the third ball attack over and over. You develop your footwork and your fore and your attack, and you become a better player. One of the reasons I became improved a lot at the start is I spent a lot of time emphasizing my serves. When I first learned to play when I was 16, 17 years old, because my serves got good early on, I started getting a lot of the balls to attack. And I find I discovered that every match different serves works. I kept I constantly developed new serves or different ones to work what would work against different players. And so I kept getting balls I could attack. So my footwork got better, my attack got better, and because of that my game got better. And because my game got better, I got to play better players. And you just keep snowballing upwards that way. It's not just serve, mm. it's also receive, things like that. If you learn to do these things, you become a better player, not just for that match, but long term. It makes you a better player, and you get to play better players, and you, that makes you better as well. Yeah, just kind of like constantly feed it each other. Up. It like, a lot of people yeah. don't understand that uh, snowball effect, which that that's a great idea for a tip of the week. That might be my tip of, of the week on Monday: uh, the snowball effect on uh, for improvement. I might do that. Cool, I like that. Um, yeah, as I, I'd, I'd love to just quickly whiz through four points from the book that that I remember at the time I, I wrote down because I thought they were just really interesting. Um, and j just, just to hear kind of in 60 seconds, just for you to give your, your kind of brief explanation of what, what I mean by these points, if sure. that's okay. I'm probably making my, this interview is already going longer than most of the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. It's, uh, they, they seem to be getting longer and longer as I, as I go through doing different episodes, just because I don't know, there, there's a lot to say. So that, that's not a problem. Okay, the first thing I wanted to to talk to you about is the kind of the difference between tactical and strategic development, which was something that it was an idea that I'd kind of thought of before reading the book, but I definitely hadn't been able to put into such concrete terms. Could you just explain what you mean by that? Okay, tactical is what you do to win now. Strategic is how you develop your game in the long term. Some people will focus on one or the other when you need both. You need to develop the tactical habits. On the other hand, if you're constantly playing people who have trouble with deep serves with one serve and you keep using it, you won't develop the other ones. Um, I know a player who developed really good long serves and he got better and better. But then when he played strong players, he could no longer win because they all looped it. And it took him years to uh, learn different serves. He was playing tactically, but strategically, he should have developed short serves as well as his long serves and it hurt him in the long run because he, not, he only developed one. So you need to think both ways. Do you find that some players are just stuck in kind of a tactical mindset, always just thinking too short term, and then you've got other players that are always thinking long term and never seem to I, actually I, get down to... I see both. I see people who stubbornly insist on playing the way they want to play 10 years from now or five years from now, and they won't think tactically. And the result is, what they understand is they're, one, not developing their, their game the way it should because they're not being able to play at a higher level. They would be able to play if they played smart tactics. And two, they're not developing the tactical habits. Top players think tactically automatically. Instinct, it's, it becomes instinct. And you don't develop that if you don't think about it. But, so a lot of people get stuck on one or the other, yes. you got to mm. get both. Otherwise, you're handicapping yourself. You're playing with a 100-pound weight on your back. Sure. So if, yeah, you, if you I, think I, just I tactics, by the way, then you're stuck. If you keep winning on... You can't develop a third ball attack if, uh, effectively if all you do is serve long and let the other guy loop, for example. So that strategically, you got to develop that. If you're a great blocker and a poor looper, well, to develop, you need to loop. 
tactically, you probably should block. Strategically, you got to develop your loop if, or your attack if you want to get better in the long run. Yeah, it's just getting the balance. Yep. Uh, okay, the second thing was, and this was something that, that I thought was really brilliant, was the idea of testing out your opponent in the first game of the match. Can you explain what you mean by that? Okay. One of the worst things I see is when someone plays in, finishes the first game, comes off the table, and still is not sure what things work and don't work against this opponent. It's very important to get that out of the way quickly. Classic example is a player will sometimes have some tricky serves, and he, he will hold back on them until the fifth game or something. You should throw all your your serves at the guy in the first game. Find out which ones work and which ones don't. Some are, are serves that you'll be able to use over and over. Others will only work a few times. But find out which ones work. And then if it's a trick serve that works in the first game, it'll probably work once in the second, once in the third, and so on. And again, the fifth, as opposed to one time in the fifth. Um, if it doesn't work, and then you put it on hold. You need to test out your opponent, see if they have a good forehand or backhand. Some people just go straight back in the backhand and never realize that the guy has a great backhand. I saw a match recently where this guy went at this guy back in the backhand, and he was on the verge of getting killed. Uh, we didn't realize he was playing this guy who was infamous for having incredible backhand and incredibly bad forehand. And down 2-0 and 7-3 in the third, uh, his dad called a timeout, and I came over, and I, was, and I, and I started talking to him. Uh, his dad hadn't started yet, so I didn't cheat. And because he, he called him while I was walking over, I said, play every ball to the sky for him, every single ball to the foreign, unless he plays a backhand from there. Then you can go back to his backhand and then go back to the foreign. And he came back, and it was just amazing how this guy had such a phenomenal backhand and no foreign at all. Rating-wise, he had a 23, 2400 backhand and about 18, 1900 foreign. Some people may know who I'm talking about. He's this guy from the Northeast, and I've coached against him a number of times. So that, it's things like that. You'd never know unless you play the guy. I once played a guy who had such a – another guy like that, such a good backhand. So I played the whole match, sir, fast to his foreign over and over. Some people are weak if you push heavy, and you don't know it unless you push a few times and see what he does. So you got to test the guy out early and find out what works and what doesn't and then learn from that. Yeah, just don't assume anything. Just try as much as possible, and who knows what, you know, what might come out of that. Yep. Cool. Uh, third thing was, you know, simple thing, but something that a lot of people, a lot of players don't do, especially at the at the lower levels, is thinking about placement, playing into the middle and the wide. Can you just explain why that's so important? It's You can almost tell right away if a person is advanced or not. Advanced players in a game, automatically every ball is w uh, wide corners or middle. Middle is where the playing elbow, the crossover between forehand and backhand. Top players know that, and they do this over and over and over. It's almost pointless to go to the middle foreign or middle back end. There's no reason ever to go there unless it's a miss hit. If you're, you either go to the wide foreign or extreme wide foreign, you go to the back end, extreme wide back end or extreme wide back end, or you go right at the person's elbow. There is a few rare occasions where you might do something different, but they're rare. And it's one of those concepts that a lot of people understand. Every ball should be going at, uh, when you attack, especially should be going to those spots. Your quick shots should be going there. Your aggressive shots should be going there. There's no reason not to go there. So that's just one of those basic concepts that people need to make a habit right from the beginning. I learned that early on, so I learned to go very, very wide to the corners. And my, I, I was good with my backhand going at the elbow. My forehand, I tend to go wide corners. I, I like to aim one wide corner and then suddenly go the other way. But I recommend going at the elbow uh, as your first attack. That's the best place a lot of times. Sure. Now, how can someone who realizes that they're not really doing this kind of develop this habit? Because we spend a lot of time doing drills into a forehand or backhand block, which is kind of the, right. the exact place that well, we don't want to be playing into. Most intermediate players, when they're warming up and drilling, they if you watch them, you'll see they're often not going corner to corner. You'll see the shots are going inside the forehand corner, inside the backhand corner. What they should be is within a few inches of the corner or even wider. Um, the middle should be the actual corner. If you make that a habit, the, like the top players do, you know that you'll see they go corner to corner. Intermediate players go inside the corner, inside the corner. Beginners go middle to middle, just pat the ball back and forth. But the idea is make it a habit of going to those two spots. A lot of times, as they get better, going to the corners uh, isn't as big a problem for the advanced uh, the players as they approach the advanced levels because the coaches will stress that. But a lot of players they don't understand that rallies the importance. Uh, there's a big difference those six inches between the middle back end or middle forehand 
and the wide back end and the wide forearm, that six inches is huge, even four inches. The middle, mm-hmm. a lot of people have trouble playing there because they never drill there. One of the things I always recommend is if is have your coach or practice partner set up at the elbow spot, line up where it is, and have them block to that spot where you attack it. Make a habit of going to that spot. Uh, mm-hmm. it, if you don't practice it, you won't do it. Good stuff. Okay, fourth one, which is another one that that was really interesting to think about was the idea of doing your tactical thinking between the points and not trying to think during points. Right. What, what did you mean by that? During a point, you have to, your mind needs to be clear. Uh, you just simply have to. Your subconscious is, is done, has been trained to do the shots. If you try consciously do them or think about them, it will mess, mess them up. During a point, you're just an observer. Watch the ball and let the things play out. This comes back to that tactical thinking. If you think tactics regularly, they become automatic. They be, it becomes a subconscious thing. Your subconscious will do the tactics. So between points is where you do the thinking. Now, some people have trouble thinking tactically and then clearing their mind. If they have trouble with that, they should practice it. You need to be able to think between points. Keep it simple. We're not talking Einsteinian physics here. You need to think about uh, think between points, what's working, what's not working. Should I serve short to the fore and long to the back end? Should I attack his elbow or whatever? If you're, on this, if you're serving, then you should be thinking what serve you should use. That's the one time where you can choose exactly. So you should be thinking a lot about your serve. The rest, if you want to attack the guy's middle, if you, th- if you make a habit of thinking tactically, your subconscious gets the message. And guess what? When the time comes, bang, you'll immediately go at the guy's elbow because it's your subconscious gets the message. Just like your subconscious learns how to loop because you practice it, it gets it learns to attack the middle or other times. If it sees the forehand side open, it will, it will go there as well. When I first learned to play tennis, I had an amazing discovery. When I was at the baseline, I am instinctively – would attack the right spot every time. I had great placement because of my table tennis, baseline shots. When I played the net, there'd be an open court, and I wouldn't even notice it because I made the discovery that, and this is this is something neurologists should study, I made the discovery that my tactical reflexes don't turn on until I backswing. I would literally be backswinging, and my subconscious at that point is making the decision whether to go wide fore and wide back in her middle, that type of thing. And when I'm at the net, I don't backswing. So when I play tennis, I discovered that, that I could never play smart. I just put the ball down the middle or whatever because the part of my subconscious that was trained in table tennis to place the ball never would turn on. I made the discovery the only way I could place the ball when I was at the net is I had to do what's called a swinging volley where I actually backswing. And the minute I backswing, bang, I put the ball, I, could, I had perfect placement, but only if I backswing. And that's it was a really strange learning experience that my subconscious tactical mind only turns on during a rally as I backswing. And, but it becomes a habit. I don't think most people think about enough to really develop these habits, but if they do it, it becomes a habit. If you watch the top players, they have perfect placement. I was watching coach Chen Yuwa play some uh, points with some people uh, a couple days ago. And it was just amazing watching every shot goes to the perfect spot. He's not consciously thinking about it. his subconscious has done this for so many years. It's just like he instantly just reacts to the perfect spot. And it's every ball catches you off guard. A lot of players just don't understand how you do that. But that's where, that's where the thinking about between points. Think between points and then clear your mind out and play it out. And then learn from that point and then continue. Yeah, so there's, there's just a big difference between when you're playing the point and when you're not playing the point instead of it all blurring into one big, long game. Right. Sport, one of the things I've pointed out is that having your mind clear is more important than tactics. I'd rather have a nice calm person playing stupid than a guy who's nervous, can't clear his mind, nothing like that, who knows what he's, you know, who's knows what he's going to do, but he's, you know, he's worried. You know, I should say, you know, a smart player who's nervous is going to lose to his peer who is nice and calm and plays dumb. So the first priority is to make sure you're calm and your mind is clear. And then you can play all sorts of brilliant tactics, but there is that sports psychology aspect. And a lot of people play dumb because their mind is not clear when they're playing. Uh, even between points, they're frozen up. They can't clear their mind and think, gee, this guy is serving short. My serve short backspin, he drops it short. If I go long, he's looping it. I, wait a minute. If I, give him, if I vary that short serve and throw him a, a simple no spin to the middle, he can't do anything. Little things like that. Or understanding that the player has trouble short to the foreign. Maybe, maybe I should serve there like because it, it worked in the past. 
they don't even think about this because their mind is not clear. If their mind is mm. clear, they'd be thinking, okay, they're handling the on the back end, they're handling the serve. Let's try short to the forehand and see what happens. That type of thing. It's amazing, but even top players sometimes their mind is not clear enough to think about these simple things. That's why you need a good coach sometimes. <laughs> Last follow-up question on that then. How can we get a clear mind? Okay, that that opens up a big thing, sports psychology. I would Google that. On my webpage, tabletenniscoaching.com, right? That's where I do my weekly tips and stuff uh, and daily blog. I have a whole section there devoted to that, but that would be another 10-hour uh, discussion. The basic <laughs> idea is you need to learn a lot of sports psychology tools, which is a little different from tactics. Uh, there's a lot – there's a – Dora Kurame, for example, DoraKurame.com. She actually has a whole website devoted to, to table tennis sports psychology, and she has a book out on it as well. So you might want to look at Dora Kurame, D-O-R-A-K-U-R, oh shoot, K-U-R-A-M-A-Y. I may be getting that wrong. It's Kurame. Sorry, yeah, Dora. I think it's I M A Y. It's funny because I actually messaged her today to try and get her on the podcast. So hopefully she'll be on in the next few weeks so we can. We can ask her that exact question. Is it K U R I M A Y? I think yeah, I think that's Good. right. Yeah. Okay, but if you look up table tennis sports psychology, it probably comes up. She's a top player and a sports psychologist. Um, but yeah, you gotta have a clear mind, or you can't really play tactics. Uh, they they go together in that way. Yeah, brilliant. Well, I mean, we're coming to the point of the of the podcast where I always ask the guests to kind of share a top tip. I feel like we've done non-stop top tips but have you got any any other tips that you can share with people particularly things that might be tactical and that people can really just go out and apply to their game now and hopefully see direct results from have you got anything to sure to share with us i, I divide tactics into three things service tactics receive tactics and rallying tactics t- rallying tactics so much you can give one for each okay okay i could give a lot but i'm gonna pull out one for each one okay serve tactics the biggest thing I see there is not enough serve variation. Uh, they either give simple backspin serves or they might give a backspin and no spin or a backspin and a side spin, but they don't throw the deep serves. They don't throw a fast no spin at the elbow. They don't move the ball around and they don't have an off serve to throw at the guy several times a game that gives them a few free points. Off serves are often ones that work a couple of times, won't work after that. If you don't develop them, they're throwing away those two points. So you need to develop more variation on your serves. Uh, it's if the other guys were turning your serve uh, well every time, that means your serve is not very good. Unless the guy's much better than you. If you're playing your peers, you should be getting a lot of weak shot, uh, shots and misses off your serve. Okay, Re- and it's not just variation in spin. You're talking about variation in speed and placement in all sorts of things. Can people sometimes you hear people say, oh, "I am varying my serves. I've done backspin serve, topspin serve, but they're doing them all short to the backhand." When right, that type of thing. Yeah, you gotta move the ball around. Um, some people don't like serving short to the forehand because it gives them angle, the opponent an angle into the wide forehand. So they're scared of it. Well, the other guy's probably happy because a lot of people have struggled on balls short to their forehand and they can't go down the line, which means you can camp out on your forehand side waiting for that ball. At the very least, try them out on that and vary that serve. Uh, one of the most underused serves is sh- where you serve from the middle of the table and go sh- either short to the forehand or long to the back end with the same motion. It tears people shreds because they have to cover both extremes from the same thing. And by serving from the middle, you get angle into the forehand. So they have to receive with their forehand. A lot of people will reach over and receive with their backhand. So it really, that's a very underused thing. One other thing that's way under, uh, on the serves, people serve too high, learn to serve low to the net. <laughs> There's a whole thing to that, you know, where you got to contact the ball low. If I got into that, it'd be a while. Uh, it'd be a whole new thing. Anyway, receive a biggest thing there is placement. People, they just don't move. They don't understand the difference between receiving the ball six, eight inches to the middle back end or going wide to the corner. If you're going to receive to the back end, go to the corner or just outside that corner. Keep it very, very wide. That means that he, the other guy can't play his forehand. And if he plays the back end, he has to move for that. Remember, he has to cover his wide forehand as well. If you go wide mm-hmm. back end, he's got a lot of ground to cover. So go to the wide back end if you're going to receive it especially if you're receiving passively. Don't push to the middle back end. Push to the corner or outside the corner. And at the last second, if they're covering it, suddenly change and go to the very, very, very wide forehand corner. So place that ball to the corner. Sometimes at the elbow is effective too if they're a two-wing looper and they have to choose as long as it, it, you're kind of quick. But just place the ball at wide corners. Then a nice solid push becomes very effective. 
I, I'm always amazed at how many people receive the ball safely out to the middle of the table or middle back end on the middle forehand. When the nice, if you're going to play safe, at least place the ball. Um, last one is rallying. Is I'm always seeing people again. I I cover this a little earlier. They go to the corners or middle back end stuff, but the fr- they don't go to the middle. And the ones who do go to the middle, they go back end into the person's back end looking for a chance to go to the middle. When you that's that's not the way to do it. Sometimes you do it that way, but usually it means the other guy's attacking and you're, then you're going to make a weaker shot to the middle and they're ready for it. Instead, mm. your first attack should go to the middle. Or if you're doing a very aggressive block against someone who's centered, your first aggressive block goes to the elbow. If your first attack goes to the elbow, one, first, the other guy is probably going to have great difficulty trying to choose between the forehand and back end. You're going to get a weak return and it draws them out of position. Usually, they're going to hit a foreigner back end, and they, they're they going to leave one of those corners open. They can't cover them, uh, both covers, unless they're very fast. Now, if they're very fast, you're probably playing at a faster pace anyway, so you still get them. But the idea is you get many more weak returns if your first attack is at the elbow, and then you play out to the corners. People get that backwards all the time. Sure, and I guess the key thing for all of this is that it's no good – just going into a match and trying to do this, it, you've got to have developed it in the training hall first so that you do that yeah. naturally, that you attack into the into the crossover with your first shot, right. that, you're, that you're comfortable going wide when you're receiving balls. Because right. if you just try and do it in a match, it's, it's not going to work, is it? Or you're going to be overthinking. Yeah. At the, starting at the advanced near immediate level, advanced levels, one of the best drills is you serve backspin, they push it back, and then your first attack, you loop it, um, your first to loop, Three-fourths of the time, you attack their elbow. About one-fourth of the time, if you, th- you go off to the corners. But you should, or three-fourths of the time in this drill, you keep attacking the elbow. Result, you get great practice attacking their elbow and following it up, and they get great practice trying to cover that middle. If people watch the top players, I think they a lot of times don't realize just how often top players' first attack is to the elbow. Now, the, the exceptions at the highest levels, when you play someone who is a really strong foreign player with great fo- uh, footwork, then they will sometimes attack to the wide back end first. It depends if it's a two-wing player or a one-wing player, but very rarely can a one-wing player um, consistently at the lower or intermediate levels cover the middle and wide foreign if you attack that spot. But if they can, then you go to the back end. But most players, mm-hmm. when you're attacking, are going to stay centered, gain ready to cover both corners, and if you go out their elbow, they're dead. You're just trying to develop the skill of finding the elbow yeah. on you, I guess. Yeah, everyone's yeah. different. I was actually, for my level, relatively strong in the middle. That was because I tend to um, favor my foreign and I kind of a quick back, uh, not quick, I, I was good covering the, the middle of my backhand. But people who were smart quickly discovered that if you hit that ball to my wide, wide backhand, I was very weak. And I, I was so grateful to the player, many players I've played over the years who never figured that out. That was my wide backhand was my weakness. <laughs> <laughs> wide wide anyway if i went over there i usually started fishing i just wasn't very good covering the wide back end sometimes for some reason with my back end for some reason yeah well this has been incredible and I've, I've wanted to have you on the show for months now so i'm so glad that we finally managed to make this happen and, yeah. and i know that people are going to really enjoy listening to this i think it's it's potentially even worth listening to this once rewinding it and listening to it again because i mean there's so much decent stuff in here that can just be applied to to your game straight away so thank you so much sure. for coming on the show larry sure yeah if you want to they can my blog is at tabletaskcoaching.com and from there you can i have a blog that goes up monday through friday uh every morning monday through friday i have this extensive blog mondays i have a tip of the week so every, every week and you can find information there about my seven books on table tests the one we were talking about was table test tactics for thinkers that's the best seller the most fun one was The Spirit of Pong, which is my fantasy table tennis novel about a U.S. player who goes to China to learn the secrets of table tennis and trains with the spirits of top players. That's that's a fun book. The tactics book and the other ones are the ones that will help you improve the most. Yeah, I've done, I've done reviews on the blog for both of those, so I'll put all of that in the show notes and links to, to Amazon and stuff. Have, have you got any, any other books coming out soon? I know you, you seem to be bringing one out roughly once a year. I actually have several planned. One is probably by the end of this year or within six months, I will have a sequel to a spirit, the spirit of Pong called Pong Man, which is another fantasy table tennis novel. This one's about a guy who's a table tennis superstar by day, superhero by night. And it's in the same universe 
as the pre as the spirit and Pong with the same characters, but now it's from his point of view as he joins the U.S. team with the hero of the previous one as they challenge the Chinese teams. Unfortunately, the North Koreans, the bad guys, are going to be intervening, and they have to go up against the Pinkin. Um, I'm planning to do a lot of work, work on that in November. Um, I've got every three years I do another book, Table Tennis Tips, which compiles all my tips. Sometime in the next few years, I plan on doing an update of Table Tennis Steps to Success. It'll be retitled Table Tennis Fundamentals. And that one is why I really go back and do a very extensive work on all parts of table tennis, but at the fundamental level, not the super advanced level. Okay. But that sounds ideal for for my kind of general audience of players. So, yeah, we'll definitely look out for that one and and we'll be letting people know when that's coming out. I might also do a thing called Parent's Guide to Table Tennis. I've been toying with that one. We'll say. <laughs> oh, that that would be that would be a brilliant idea, I think. Yeah, it's outlined. Right. Thank you. Thanks very much, Larry. It's Thank- been brilliant talking to you. I better let you yeah, go to bed. It's past midnight on your time. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and that Julian Waters I mentioned, he's English. He came to the United States and is I'm not sure how old he was, but he's he's British. <laughs> okay. All right. You have a good cool. night. Yeah. You too. I'll see you later. Let me see if I can figure out how to turn this off. <laughs> I say <laughs> good night. Go cool, see ya. I would like to say a huge thank you to Larry for joining us on the show. I had a lot of fun talking to him and it was brilliant to hear all the different ways that we can use tactics and incorporate them into our game. Larry was just bombarding us with tips and there was so much good stuff in that interview. Loads of things that I haven't thought about myself or have just forgotten that I'm going to be trying to apply to my game. So I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you got a lot out of it and I hope that you're able to start to apply some of those principles to your actual match play and see some results from them because that's the whole purpose of the podcast and that's exactly what Larry is was trying to do with it with his book is just to give you some ideas to get you thinking. I really liked the whole idea of just developing the habit of tactical thinking, viewing it as a habit that you need to train yourself to get into. And as I said in the interview, that was definitely something that I didn't do enough as a child. I just went out there and played, didn't really think tactically in my matches. I was more just thinking about how I was playing, how I was feeling, which when it comes down to it in the long run, isn't the way the best players are going to be playing. The the best players are going to be thinking about their opponent, how to beat their opponent, how to make their opponent play badly, what their opponent's strengths and weaknesses are. And I never really got into that habit. And that's definitely held me back as I've then moved into the senior game. And you see there's a lot more tactical play going on. And it's not good enough just to get your head down and play your own games. So that's definitely something that we should all be looking to do. And it doesn't matter if, if like me, you didn't do it when you were a kid. Let's start now. Let's start developing the habit of tactical thinking in our matches. That's what I've really taken from this interview. And I'm starting to play a little bit more this season. I'm doing kind of training once a week and and a few league matches and stuff. So I'm going to be trying to put that tactical thinking habit into my game as much as possible. As always, I would like to say a huge thank you to all of you guys for listening to the show. It's great to see that the number of downloads has been steadily increasing. We were very close to getting 5,000 downloads in the month of September. I'm hoping that we can smash through that in October. The way that you can help me make that happen is just to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes if that's what you use to listen to the show. Please use the Facebook and Twitter share buttons to share the show with your friends. And if you can head over and leave us a review on iTunes, I'd really appreciate that as well. That just helps us to move up the rankings and and get noticed in in Apple and iTunes charts and all that kind of stuff that's going to help get the podcast in front of more potential listeners. Joining me on next week's episode is Mark Berman, who is another table tennis coach. Uh, based in the southeast of England and Mark was actually my first ever table tennis coach so back when I was nine or ten years old and started playing table tennis at the local leisure centre Mark Berman was my coach so it's going to be really interesting to talk to him Um, we'll take a bit of a trip down memory lane and see what he can remember of what I was like as a ten year old we can talk about the kind of things that we were doing at the club back then Um, And then Mark's got loads of other ideas and thoughts that he'd like to share about coaching and development of players in general. So I'm really looking forward to that. I think that's going to be a little bit different, but a lot of fun to to kind of think back to exactly what kind of things I was doing when I was first starting out, because I do feel like I had 
access to quite a few good coaches when I was first starting. And that's really what helped me to improve quickly and really get stuck into the sport. So I'm really looking forward to doing that interview. I'll be speaking to Mark in a few days time for that one. I hope you have a really good week. I'll see you next Friday. You can head over to experttabletennis.com to have a look at everything else that I'm getting up to with table tennis videos, blog posts. It's all there, experttabletennis.com. See you in a week's time.